Hey everybody, welcome back to Reading with Mrs. H. I am Mrs. H and we are reading Ms. Bixby's Last Day by John David Anderson. And my goal is to get two videos in today. Because by the time you see this, you'll know if I succeeded or not. So, <laughs> Hi, Eli. There, say hi. Hi, Eli. <laughs> Alright, this next chapter is Point of View of Topher. George Nelson is gone, and all of our cash with him. Guess I'm probably not the first person in history to say that. We are out the door in seconds. The bottles of wine set totteringly back on their shelf. Behind me, I can hear the guy from What Ails You yelling at us. Words that Brand would have to make up safer ones to replace. But we don't stick around to hear the whole thing. <coughs> Something about us never stepping foot in his store again, I think. And a word about our mothers. Outside now. Look left, right, scan the area. Blue shirt, torn jeans, black hair. There, on the corner. The thief looks back at us and takes off down the street, moving fast. There he is, after him. I've always wanted to say that. Brand is first, me right behind, Steve bringing up the rear, saying something about a backpack and bouncing and heavy, but I just yell for him to keep up. George Nelson is getting away. I catch up to Brand and huff, huff out the play-by-play. -play. Suspect is a Caucasian male, 5'9", 180 pounds, fleeing on foot, Last seen at the intersection of whatever street we are running down and whatever street we are about to turn on to. I wait for Brand to contribute something. Ask if he's armed and dangerous, maybe. If we should proceed with caution. But instead, he just adds that the suspect is a freaking jerk. He's so angry, he can't even come up with his own word. We tear around the corner like zombies are chasing us. <clears throat> Though the only one behind us is Steve who already seems on the verge of collapse. Up ahead, George Nelson runs into the street, <coughs> chancing another glance behind him as he launches himself into the intersection. A car screeches to a halt, tires peeling, and George slams into it, catching the bumper with his knee. He spins once but keeps on running, causing more screeching and honking. The driver of the car that nearly flattened him, rolls down his window and starts cursing as Brand and I catapult into the street. We don't, you don't look both ways when you're chasing the bad guy. Poor choice. <laughs> Brand circles around the car that nearly ran over the thief, but on an impulse, I put both hands on the hood and more or less vault over the front of it. Not the same as jumping on the thing and leaping from the one top of a car to the next, which is what I want to do, but it's as close as I'm going to get. The guy in the car yells something about my mother, too, and lays on his horn. As we make it to the sidewalk, I glance behind me to see Steve on the pavement at the edge of the intersection, leaning against a mailbox, waving us on. You guys, go on without me, he yells. Then he collapses, legs pretzeled beneath him. Man down, I say, but Brand doesn't stop. He can't stop. George Nelson is still at least 30 yards ahead of us. We fly past grimacing pedestrians. I'm surprised at how fast Brand is. It takes everything I've got to keep up with him. We cross in front of bars and restaurants, underneath the forest green awnings of old hotels. The perp is less than 50 feet away now. We are gaining on him. The loose gravel kicks up from my shoes. My backpack pistons up and down with each step. Somebody I, I nearly run into tells me to watch it. I apologize, even though heroes never apologize. They are too busy saving the day. We're catching up, I yell at Brand. Suddenly I feel a sharp pain in my side. I've been shot, obviously. Sniper on the roof, covering the criminal's escape. I reach down to my ribcage and hitch a breath. No blood. No bullet. Just a cramp. <clears throat> I'm not used to running this much. 
I leave my hand pressed against my side and keep running. From somewhere far away, I'm almost positive I hear helicopter blades. Or it could be the sound of a car engine. Up the street, the perp glances backwards and sees that we are right behind him. He knocks over a metal trash can, tipping it into the middle of the sh sidewalk with a reverberating gong. It's a classic move, I think. It's exactly what I would have done. Bran simply goes around the trash can, just like he did the car. Practical. I'm not Bran. I'm James Bond. I'm Jason Bourne. I'm super freaking Mario come to life. I'm the Cape Crusader, sans cape. I don't go around. I go over. I leap. I practically fly. I catch the edge of the aluminum can with my back foot. I fall, twisting, my front foot turning underneath me as I try to catch myself. I hit the sidewalk hard, sprawled out, chin scraped, backpack catapulting up over my head. I cry out, completely un-007 like. A few feet away, Brand hears my cry of pain and stops, looks back at me, then up at George Nelson, who is turning another corner. Go, I wince, holding my chin with one hand, reaching for my foot with the other. I'm all right. But he can see I'm not all right. My ankle screams. I can feel it pulsing. I can't even begin to try to move my foot, let alone stand. Hmm, this sounds kind of familiar to me. Maybe it's broken, or maybe it's just sprained. But it shoots needles of pain up my leg. I try to crawl. I close my eyes and will myself to my knees. Get on your feet. What kind of caped crusader are you? I scrabble upward. But the instant I put weight on my left foot, I tumble right back down. Whole leg throbbing, blood pounding in my ears. The whole city swirls around me. I close my eyes. It's similar to how I felt when I broke my foot. But, uh, yeah, I wasn't chasing a bad guy. But maybe I should say I was. Uh, this is so stupid. It was a stupid idea. Giving our money to some total stranger. I bite down on my lower lip and pound the sidewalk with my fist, which only serves to make it hurt as well. Then I feel a pair of hands underneath my sweaty armpits. Come on, soldier, Brand says. Brand lifts me and pulls one of my arms over his shoulder. Propping me up, he half carries, half drags me past the bags of trash over to a nearby bench, then bends down to inspect my ankle. I scan the street ahead of us. George Nelson is nowhere to be seen now. We've lost him. And our 25 bucks. Our mission is officially gerfragged. I wince as Brand pokes at my ankle. Gingerly peels down my sock. He got away. I tell him. Yeah, Bran says, unlacing my shoe and carefully slipping it off. He's got our money. Yeah, Bran says again, gently moving my foot fractions of an inch, watching my face to see how much it hurts. I try not to show him. He slowly moves my foot in a circle, and I suck in a breath and scrunch my eyes, blinking back tears. Heroes don't cry. The pain is shifting from a Butcher knife stabbing to a hammer blow aching. I don't think it's broken, Bran sighs. Probably just twisted it. I look back at the metal trash can lying impertinently in the middle of the sidewalk. I guess I shouldn't have tried to jump it. Bran nods. You're not Superman, you know. I look away. I know that. Of course I know that. I just don't need to hear it from him. It's true. I sometimes imagine my life is different. That I'm somebody else. Maybe more than sometimes. But I'm not the only one around who makes stuff up. Don't eat the book. Eli's trying to eat our book, friends. <clears throat> Adults are always telling you you can be whatever you want when you grow up. But they don't mean it. They don't believe it. They just want you to believe it. It's a fairy tale, like the tooth fairy, something they tell you that gets you excited about something not so fantastic. If you think about it, it's pretty gross. Your teeth just falling out of your head, leaving bloody sockets for your tongue to poke through, but the story makes it better and the dollar makes it worth it. 
Then one afternoon, you sneak into their bedroom and open the drawer of their nightstand, looking for the DS that they confiscated as punishment for your jumping on the roof of the car again. And you find the little Tupperware full of a dozen jagged pearls, caked brown with your own dried blood, your name written in black sharpie across a piece of scotch tape, and you stare at them for a moment in disbelief, wondering if maybe they aren't what you think they are. Maybe they are someone else's teeth. They can't be yours because your teeth are in Neverland, or Toothtopia, or outer space, or wherever kleptomaniac fairies live. So you confront them. Your lying, scheming parents. Over breakfast, you ask your mom about the Tooth Fairy, where she lives, what she does during the day, how she manages to collect so many teeth each night, and how come some kids' teeth, like Robbie Dinkler's, are worth five bucks when yours only fetch a dollar apiece. And you see her search for some explanation that is at once both magical and believable, but you know she's just making it up as she goes. It's the same with all grown-ups. Uh, they tell you what they think you want to hear and let life tell you the truth later. You can be an astronaut or the president of the United States or second baseman for the White Sox, but you can't really because you hate math, you aren't rich, and you can't even hit the ball. It's just another fairy tale. So when your next tooth falls out, you figure you'll just ask them if they'd like to keep it or throw it away because you're not buying it anymore. Or maybe not. Maybe you won't tell them. Maybe you're still, you'll still put your teeth under your pillow. Because sometimes it's better to believe in the impossible. To believe you are a secret agent or a private detective or a superhero and not just a kid with freckled cheeks and gangly arms who is too clumsy to leap a tipped over garbage can in a single bound. Until you are lying in the middle of the sidewalk with a throbbing ankle a bloody chin, wishing you hadn't even tried. Brand goes back for Steve. It takes longer than I thought it would. I sit and wait on the bench and poke tentatively at my already swollen ankle. It's not as bad as I first thought. I don't think it will need to be amputated. <laughs> Unfortunately, there won't even be a scar to show off. I got a scar from mine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it still hurts like a mother when I try to move it. When I see the two of them coming up the street, I know something is wrong. Not just that George Nelson has run off with our cash. Something else. Bran looks mad enough to punch through brick walls. Steve hangs his head in shame. He's carrying his backpack in his arms, cradling it like an infant. Show him, Bran says, when they make it to my spot. My foot propped on my own backpack with the book for Ms. B inside. Show me what? Steve reluctantly <clears throat> kneels down and opens his pack. I know what's coming. I can see the state of the white box. Its corners crunched, one side caved in. He opens the lid. There sits 25 bucks worth of heaven, except it looks like it's been through hell. Michelle's formerly divine white chocolate raspberry supreme cheesecake now looks like a giant heaping turd of white and red Play-Doh mixed together. I'm guessing the heat and the running caused it to soften and then be repeatedly smashed into the side... And then be repeatedly smashed into the sides of the box, taking a beating... With every step. It's a deformed monster of a dessert now. The hunchback of cheesecakes. I bet it still tastes okay. But I'm not sure I'd want to be the first to try it. It's lumpy, I say. Kind of like my ankle. It's ruined, Bran says. The whole thing. He doesn't look at me when he says this. But I know that it's somehow my fault. I know that's what he means. Even though this was all his idea to begin with. Even though Steve was the one carrying the cake. It's still my fault. Without me, 
there wouldn't have been a George Nelson. Without the high-speed chase, we'd still have our money. And our cheesecake would still look more like a wheel than a mound of bloody mashed potatoes. I stare at it, sitting in its half-collapsed cardboard container. It looks nothing like the cake sitting behind the glass at the store. It's just a cake, Steve replies, closing the lid and taking a seat beside me. An expensive cake, I say. Brand looks across the street. I think maybe he's looking for George Nelson still, but his eyes are glazed over, like he no longer recognizes where we are. Steve somehow wrangles the box back into his backpack, though at this point it seems we might just as well toss the whole thing in the trash. So now what? he asks timidly. Even after all this, he's still looking at me for a plan. I, <laughs> I don't know what to tell him. We've got three dollars in change, a twisted ankle, a ruined cake. It's not as if we can run to the cops. Excuse me, officer, but you won't believe this. The guy we bribed to buy us a bottle of wine ran off with our money. I can already hear the laughter. Stop that. He actually... <laughs> Eli. We're trying to read this book, not eat it. Uh, excuse me, officer, but you won't believe this. The guy who we bribed to buy us a bottle of wine ran off with our money. I can already hear the laughter. And I can't imagine Brand could work the same magic with the guy at What Ails You that he did on Eduardo and get us a free bottle. Not after what that man said about our mothers. So where do we go from here? That's what Steve wants to know. What do you think? I ask back. Well, I guess we could still do it, Steve su suggests. Go to the hospital, I mean, to visit Miss Bixby. While we're there, you could have your ankle looked at. I give him a dirty look. I can't help it. That's a great idea. Let's go to the emergency room and have the nurse call my parents so I can explain how we skipped school to come downtown and I broke my ankle chasing the guy who stole all of our money. That we Then we can call your parents and tell them the same thing. As soon as I say it, I feel bad. Steve's shoulders slump, chin digging into his chest. The thought of calling his parents terrifies him. He draws something in the gravel with his toe. I'm just saying, it really doesn't matter what it looks like. What matters is that we tried, right? Standing beside us, Bran takes one more look at Steve's backpack. Then down the street where George Nelson disappeared. It looks like he's holding his breath. His face turns red for a moment. It's not right, he says. He turns his back to us and starts walking. But he's not headed in the direction of what ails you, or even the direction of the hospital. He's headed back towards the bus stop. Hold up! Where are you going? Steve calls out. But Bran doesn't answer. And he doesn't stop, either. I try to stand, still holding my left shoe in my hand. I make it three hobbling steps before Steve is beside me, propping me up. Bran, hold on! I call after him. Seriously, where are you going? I'm going home, Brand calls back angrily. I start to limp after him, using Steve as my crutch. Then Steve mutters, uh, Christ, which he almost never does, and says something about the cake and leaves me hopping on one foot, and I feel like I'm about to topple over. I put my weight down on the swollen ankle, take a tentative step, though it's more of a skip, and another bolt of pain shoots up my shin. Behind me, Steve is grabbing his pack with a mutilated cake. I call out for Brand to stop again, except I have to yell this time. That's how far he's gotten already. Seriously, man, hold up! Brand freezes, his back still to us, and I gingerly take a few more steps. Steve once again is beside me holding one of my arms around his shoulders. When we are only a few feet away, Bran turns around and I can see his cheeks are smeared wet with tears. I don't think I've ever seen him cry before. You don't get it, he says, nearly shouting back at us. It's over. We screwed up. It's just a cake, I say under my breath, 
It's the only thing I can think of to say. Bran shakes his head. No, not just the cake. It was a stupid idea, all of it. It was stupid and pointless and a complete waste of time because there was nothing, nothing we could do that would make the slightest bit of difference. Not this, he says, reaching over and practically wrenching the backpack off Steve's shoulders. Not the wine or the stupid music or your stupid book. You can't cure cancer with a freaking cheesecake. He stands there for a moment facing us, daring us, it seems, to come up with something, anything, to prove him wrong. I open my mouth, but my throat is dry and nothing comes out. Brand turns and continues to walk down the sidewalk. I totter after him. Brand, wait. For what, he says, spinning to face us. For things to get better, because they don't. Ever. They just get worse. The guy took our money. It's gone. You're limping. The cake is ruined. We barely have enough cash to get back. The plan is shot. If you two want to go, go. But I can't do it. I'm done. I'm going home. Steve and I look at each other. So that's it, I ask? All that talk about doing something and how she deserves something better? She does deserve something better, Bran shouts. And now you just want to quit? Bran's eyes narrow, and I know I've pushed him too far. He points to me. You can't say that. You don't understand. This was the one day, my one chance, and now... He doesn't finish the thought, though, just wipes his nose on his sleeve and repeats, You don't understand, before turning and walking away. What about Miss Bixby? I call out to his back. What about Miss Bixby? I call again, even louder, but I get no answer. About Miss Bixby. She always wanted to be a magician. She told me that once. She took the whole class, in fact. I'm sorry, she told the whole class, in fact. We had just started reading The Hobbit and asked her who her favorite character was. She said, are you kidding? Gandalf, who else could it be? Then she told us a story of how her grandmother almost murdered her gerbil. She wanted to be a magician, but not just some street magician pulling cards from sleeves or making a little red ball disappear. She wanted to be a master illusionist, like David Copperfield or Lance Burton, the kind who can make anything vanish before your very eyes, people, buildings, you name it. As a kid, she pored over dog-eared magic books checked out of the library. She kept a deck of cards in her backpack, put on nickel shows for her parents and friends, and dazzled the lunch ladies by pulling pennies from their hairnets. Then one day, she decided she was ready to try one of the classics, the pull a rabbit from a hat trick. She had an oversized top hat made of thin plastic and lined with black felt, a Christmas present that was much too big to fit on her head, but plenty large enough to tuck a rabbit into, complete with a false bottom, good for stashing anything from colorful scarves to cottontails. What she didn't have was the rabbit, so she asked her parents. What she got stop. <laughs> Eli's getting into everything here, guys. Uh, what she got was gerbils. Two of them. She named them Siegfried and Roy. She practiced with them daily, stuffing them in the hat and waving her plastic wand, then reaching in and grabbing hold of the two gerbils to imaginary applause. When she felt she had the trick down, she invited her friends and family, directed them to the living room, and charged them each a quarter admission. <laughs> All was going well. She ran through her gamut of card and coin tricks and even managed to pull a ribbon out of her mother's nose. Then it was time for the grand finale. Twenty minutes before, she had done all the prep work, choosing Roy because he had the least jittery, he was the least jittery of the pair. She secreted him away in the hat's trick bottom, complete with small holes for air and cushioned with extra black cloth so that he wouldn't get jostled during the performance. Now, with the crowd enthralled and her father videotaping, young Maggie Bixby pulled out her hat, quickly showed that there was nothing in it, and reached inside. Except, as she told our class, there was really nothing in it. 
and the time she had taken to do her three card tricks and pull a ribbon from her mother's nostril, Roy had chewed a hole through both the felt lining and the outer plastic shell. The moment she reached into the hat, Roy launched himself from the table and belly flopped onto the carpet where he proceeded to terrorize the audience, particularly Miss Bixby's grandmother who shrieked, RAT! and tried to stomp the life out of him. The young magician barely managed to save her furry assistant, throwing herself into the fray and grabbing him by his tail. It was, as she told the class, a disaster. She was devastated. Ten-year-old Maggie Bixby took one look into her father's camera and then ran to her room, hot tears on her cheeks. Roy was okay, though, right? Allison Snyder asked after Ms. Bixby told the story. I mean, he didn't get hurt, did he? Roy was fine, Ms. Bixby said, but she never tried the trick again. In fact, from that point on, she said, she more or less gave up on her dream of being a professional magician. Then, in typical Bixby fashion, she asked us what the moral of the story was. A gerbil is not a rabbit, Rebecca Rautabush guests, earning her a true from Ms. Bixby. Don't save your best trick until the very end, Mason Foster offered. People shouldn't pull anything out of other people's noses, Steve said, <laughs> looking, uh, looking right at Brand. But Brand had a different moral. There's no such thing as magic, he said, without even being called on. At this point, Ms. Bixby frowned. Maybe, she said, or maybe I should have tried harder. The moment you doubt whether you can fly, you cease forever to be able to do it. Miss Bixby smiled at the class then, though I had a feeling the smile was meant mostly for Brand. Sometimes when Miss Bixby smiled at you, you had the feeling she'd been saving it just for you, that the smile actually had your name on it, that she could read your mind and knew you needed that smile more than anything else in the room. Then she closed The Hobbit, promising we'd get back to it later, stood up and set it in her empty chair. All right, and that is the end of that chapter. Boy, that's a description of the uh, ankle injury gave me a little bit of uh, flashbacks there. The um, when I twisted, when I broke my foot, I had twisted my ankle too. So that sounded very familiar. Um, anywho, Eli has been very active here while we've been reading this chapter. He took a bite out of our book. Let's see if I can. I don't know if you can see that or not, but yeah. He, oh, there we go. Yeah, he took a bite out of our book. He lie. <laughs> he want he he needs a lot of attention since he's it's been about a month now he's been here with us. And I tell you friends, it is like having a little baby in the house. See? See this? But <laughs> uh he screams at me if I leave the room. He's Yes, I'm talking about you. You wanna give me a kiss? He uh yeah. Yeah, he's very, very needy. He's very, very attached to me. I love him a lot, too. <laughs> but I don't like being screamed at, do I, Eli? <laughs> All right, anyway, when the next part of the story is ready, you'll find it right about here. You can click my picture in, the, in that corner to subscribe. If you enjoy this story, please click like. And uh, if you know anyone else who might enjoy it, please share it with them. All right, that's about it. And until next time... <laughs> Keep reading. <laughs>